Justin Miller, Rockstar Card Physics here, and we've got some more work to do. All right, so, let me find a nice little pin here. What we're gonna look at, at this point, is what is known as the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect was something that Einstein worked on, and it was a, something that was curious at the time, back in the early 1900s. And it was observed that when you shine light on certain materials, namely metals, that electrons will be ejected from that metal. So the idea was, okay, light comes in, and that light gives its energy to the electrons on the surface of that metal, and once they receive enough energy, they can be removed from the metal. And they have some kinetic energy afterwards and all that good stuff. But there were some other curious things that occurred that weren't explained so much by classical physics. So this is what we've got going on. We'll do a little photoelectric effect apparatus here. So we've got what is known as the emitter, which is just the metal in question that we're gonna shine light on. And then we've got ourselves over here, the collector, which will collect the emitted electrons. And this is generally encased in some evacuated tube here. And then we got some variable power supply. And that's connected to this and this. And ultimately, get kind of like a positive potential here, negative potential here. And what's gonna happen? Why do we have this potential difference here, this power supply? Well, what we want is to be able to measure, a little ammeter here. We wanna be able to measure any current that is substantiated by electrons that are ejected from this emitter. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take some monochromatic light and we're gonna shine it onto this emitter. And once we shine it onto this emitter, we may find that electrons are ejected from this emitter and they are caught in the electric field between these two plates because of the source potential and the electrons will go from low potential to high potential, moving in the opposite direction of the electric field, but they'll be caught in it and they'll be forced to go this way and they'll cycle back around, redeposit on the surface and we'll substantiate this current that we can measure with our ammeter here. Fantastic, right? So we do this. We take some light, we shine it on there, and we get ourselves a current. We make the light more intense. And what do we get? We get more current. Now there's a saturation value, but ultimately there's only so many electrons that can be on the surface at any given one moment in time. But nonetheless, there's correlations with some classical ideas that, yeah, we dump some energy via light onto the surface of this, and the electrons take that energy, and once they have enough, they pop off, they get caught in the electric field, and they cycle back around. But that's not what was going on. Why do we say that's not what was going on? Well, because it was observed that if you fell below a certain frequency of light, that you don't get anything. So this is where the problem arose that Einstein had to come along and figure out. So you're shining this light, so monochromatic light has a certain frequency, great. And then you take a different source of light that has a lower frequency, larger wavelength. And what do you do? You shine it on this and all of a sudden you find that, hey, this light's not ejecting any electrons. We're not measuring any current. So you make it more intense and say, well, we just need more intensity. Still, you don't get anything. You let it sit there for hours, increasing the intensity, increasing the intensity, and it doesn't matter how much of this light you dump on there, you don't get any current. You don't get any ejection of electrons from the emitter. And then you take something with a little bit higher frequency, and you do. And you try to narrow it down, and you find that there's a transition frequency, a frequency of light that will give you ejected, fo excuse me, ejected electrons, and then below that, you don't get anything. And that's known as what is called the cutoff frequency. 
But this was curious because this sort of defied the classical idea that hey, the electrons are just continuously absorbing energy. Once they've absorbed enough to be removed from the surface, they're removed. Because in the classical limits, it shouldn't matter what frequency of light you're using. It should matter how much intensity it has. And as long as they have long enough to absorb enough energy, electrons should be able to be removed from the surface. That's not what was going on. So Einstein came along and said, well, maybe it has to do with the particle nature of light, with these photons. And maybe it's just a one-to-one -one interaction between a singular photon and a singular electron. And that photon has an energy, HF, known from Planck. And perhaps that if that one singular photon does not have the energy to remove the electron from the surface, then it's not removed, no matter how many of those photons continuously bombard it. It's a one-to-one -one interaction between one photon and one electron at a time. It either has enough energy to remove it, or it does not. So, this is what basically solved this problem out. And, whoop, that's, that's Einstein, smart guy, right? So, <clears throat> this is what we do, shine light, light, and we get ourselves ejected electrons. And it was observed the flight below a certain frequency No electrons are ejected. So, again, the solution to this by Einstein process of ejecting an electron is one to one with an incoming photon. Scoot on over here. Either the photon interacting has enough energy to remove the electron, Electrons are removed. So, this is known as the photoelectric effect. And the electrons that are liberated or ejected are often called the photoelectrons. They're just electrons on the surface that interact with the photons that well, undergo the, the process of the photoelectric effect. They're not different types of electrons, they're just the ones that, again, um, interact with the photons themselves. So, they call them photoelectrons. Big deal. So what do we have here? Well, there's some other things that were found. And those other things that were found were that you can start varying this potential difference here. And there's a certain potential difference that you will get no more current as well, even if you are ejecting electrons. We'll get to that. But that's some other things that one can play around with and why we would care to have a varying potential difference here. So, let us do this. 
energy required to remove an electron from the surface of the material is called phi, the work function of the material. So, different materials have different work functions. And again, I remember when I was first going through this stuff, and I said, work function? What do you mean function? And it's an unfortunate name, in my opinion. It's just some amount of energy that is required to remove the electrons from the surface of a given material. That's it. It's a constant for a given material. For instance, the work function for sodium down over there, 2.46, 2.46 electron volts. So for you to remove an electron from the surface of sodium, it will take 2.46 electron volts of energy to do so. And that is to just remove it. For silver, 6 point, nope, sorry, 4.73 electron volts. That is the work function for silver. So those are just constants, once again, depend on the material in question. So work function, it's not a function really, it's just the amount of energy. All right, so this phi is the minimum. amount of energy needed to liberate an electron. If the photon interacting has less energy then B, nothing happens. If it has more energy, then B, the extra energy to the kinetic energy of the ejected photoelectron. write out a nice little expression that kind of sums up everything. We've got this. E sub gamma is the photon energy. Where we know that that is H times F, or assuming that we're in a vacuum, HC over lambda, was the photon energy dependent on the frequency and Planck's constant H. And then we've got phi is the work function. That's fantastic. And then we've got the difference between the photon energy and the work function is the energy that's left over. So we've got 4 e sub gamma equal to, equal to or greater than phi, we can write that K E C 
sub E for the electron is equal to E sub gamma minus V. That would be the difference between the photon energy and the minimum amount of energy required to liberate the photoelectron. What's left over is kinetic energy. If E sub gamma exactly equals the work function, it's just removed. If there's no potential difference to get it caught up into, like in this system, and make it sweep over, then you don't measure any current, but you still remove the electron. As we get higher and higher um, photon energies, then well, we've got more and more kinetic energy that's resulting in the ejected electron. And yeah, even if they're not caught up in an electric field and swept over to this other plate, something will inevitably hit that other plate and be cycled around. Anyways, that's what we've got going on. So this is the nice expression that we want to get here. Now, what we can look at with this is what happens if E sub gamma is less than phi? We've already said, it. if the photon energy is less than the work function, we get nothing. So what we can look at is the equal part. What if E, let me just change this. No, that's okay. If E sub gamma is equal to phi, we'll get Ke sub E is equal to zero, giving zero is equal to E sub gamma minus phi, which then says what? Well, this says E sub gamma is equal to phi, and E sub gamma is, again, equal to HF or HC over lambda. But this is really the cutoff point. Cutoff energy, we could say. If we go below this energy, we get nothing. So that's the cutoff for the photoelectric effect occurring. So we can define what is known as the cutoff frequency and the cutoff wavelength. Again, H is Planck's constant. We note if F is a less than F sub C, we have light below the cutoff frequency. or we can also define what's known as the cutoff wavelength because we can also define the photon energy by HC over lambda. We can say we can also define the cutoff wavelength of lambda sub C and we get that by 
HC over lambda is equal to phi through again looking at the cutoff energy here. And we solve that out for solve that out for a lambda sub C, and we get ourselves HC divided by phi. And note if lambda is greater than lambda sub C. are above the cutoff wavelength and thus no electrons are ejected. But notice something about this, right? above in this case, whereas for the cutoff frequency, we said below. Well, that's because energy is proportional to frequency, but inversely proportional to wavelength. So larger wavelength, less energy. Smaller frequency, less energy. So that's why you get this inversion between the two. But generally, it's easiest, I think, to talk about light in terms of its wavelengths. It's something that we're a little bit more familiar with, but do it with frequencies too, doesn't really matter. We do have to be careful of is generally the wave, excuse me, generally the work function is given in terms of electron volts. And well, generally we're expressing H in terms of joule seconds and the speed of light in meters per second, which is all SI, which gives us joules up here. Joules divided by electron volts. For the most part, you have to do some sort of unit conversion, um, either convert HC into um, electron volts or convert the work function into joules. But that's something you definitely have to be careful of because if you don't, it's wrong. All right, what else can we say about this? I'm gonna race this up and we'll look a little bit more at the uh, stopping potential and then we'll do a nice little problem with this as well. All right, give me one second. All right, so what we want to do is look at that variable power supply a little bit, but we're going to actually reverse the terminals and see what we've got going on. So we're going to assume this is kind of an evacuated tube. We've got ourselves the collector. We've got ourselves the emitter. Great, we go ahead and shine some monochromatic light, light with one singular frequency. And wavelength onto that. And what do we get? Well, we definitely get that we're assuming that we are above the cutoff frequency, below the cutoff wavelength. And we get ourselves some electrons that are ejected. And they're doing what they do. But we're also going to go ahead and hook this up to a source potential. So I'm going to go like this. I'm going to go like this. But instead of this one being plus and this one being minus, I'm going to make this one minus and this one plus. We'll still have a B variable. That's fine. But there's the plus. There's the minus. So what does that do in terms of switching the terminals for this power supply? Well, it switches the direction of the electric field between these two plates, right? Kind of think of these plates as plates with parallel plate capacitor. Even though I've got them substantially far apart here, we can imagine that there's some electric field that goes from positive to negative, right? So we've got some electric field that's like this here. We'll just kind of say it's uniformish looking. The field itself is not super important, but we're going to see what's interacting here. And what happens when these electrons are ejected? Well, we've got electrons now that are in an electric field like this as they're ejected. So I can take an electron here and say there we've got an electron. What direction is the electric field force exerted on this electron? Say, well, for an electron, we've got, well, for anything, we've got the, the electric field force, let me not do little e, Q times E hat, Q is equal to E minus in this case. 
or we could just write it as negative e. And what does that mean? Well, that means that the force is ultimately in the opposite direction of the electric field. We've already known that from E and M. This is the direction of the electric field force, F sub E. Well, that means that these electrons with this configuration here feel a force back this way. So we take this light, we eject them, we shine this light on this emitter. Electrons are spat out in a sense, but then they enter this electric field and they feel this force this way on them. All right, so what we want to do is start playing around with this variable power supply here and changing its strength by keeping it in this orientation. So we'll start off with it off. No power supply, what happens? Well, we definitely get that an electron will make it over here um, just by the nature of it being ejected, having some leftover energy, and traversing that distance. But we want to be able to be measuring stuff, so we go ahead and throw in an amateur here. Let's not worry about that. Let's just come back to this and say, well, there is some potential difference between these two plates. Like such, right? And if an electron is going to move all the way from this plate to this plate, substantiating a current that we can measure, then it has to have enough energy to go from here to here. That is, after it's removed, it has to have enough kinetic energy to allow it to move all the way through this potential difference. And ultimately, the minimum amount of kinetic energy it has is related to this the minimum amount of kinetic energy it must have is related to this potential difference. Because it's moving through potential difference, there will be a change in potential energy. So we go like this. As an electron moves from the emitter to the collector, or I should say toward, it is moving through a potential difference. Great, great. So what does that mean? There is thus some change in potential energy. occurs as it moves. It may make it to the collector only if its initial kinetic energy greater than or equal to its change in potential energy. Why? Well, because now it's in a conservative field here. As it moves this way, it's converting kinetic energy into potential energy. And because it's moving in the opposite direction of the field, well, there's negative work being done. There's an increase in potential energy, it would be slowing down, and if we want it to make it here, then it has to be able to have enough kinetic energy to make it all that way. And that's given by this expression here. If it just barely makes it, boom, we'd be saying that these two are equal. But if it has a little extra, then yeah, it strikes this, this surface here with some amount of velocity. Anyways, we've got this going on. Well, what do we know about delta PE? Delta PE is Q times delta V in general, right? That's just the general expression for it. 
So what do we have with this? Well, we have conservation of energy delta ke is equal to negative delta p. All right. Well, <clears throat> the electron, initially like absolute values really, but no, that's k initial. If the electron just makes it, Final speed of v equals zero, that means that it just barely had enough kinetic energy to make it that whole distance there, right? What would happen if we increased the, <clears throat> the source potential a little bit? Well, we wouldn't get that occurring anymore because now the potential energy, um, the change of potential energy would be, have to be greater than what's available in order for it to go all the way through. So we call the potential difference that it moves through for just making it to the edge here, the stopping potential. A little sloppy. Find that potential difference as V sub S, the stopping potential. If we increase the potential difference of the source greater than the stopping potential, then we don't get any current, no measurable current, because the electrons will come this way and then be swept back here, substantiating no current in the circuit here. If they just can make it over, then it can pull them back and then do it again and we will get a little current. But as we start increasing the source potential more and more, we get that well, the electrons um, don't move close to this, as close to that. So as we increase this, maybe the electrons only go out to here then sweep back. We decrease it a little bit, whew, they go all the way there. We decrease it a little bit more. Whew. Finally, we decrease it just enough where, oh, they just make it. And boom, that's, that's where we're at. So if we go above that potential difference of this, we reach the stopping potential, and boom, that's it. that's it. So that delta V, we're gonna call V sub S, and for that, we've ultimately got delta KE is equal to negative delta PE. So we've got ourselves that delta KE, KE final minus KE initial, Ke final would be equal to zero. So from this, Ke final is equal to zero. Just makes it. So we get that Ke initial is equal to of the minus sign between the two for Ke final minus Ke initial goes away. And we've got ourselves um, delta Pe then equal to E V set of S. So let's go back to this really quick. We've already said that delta PE is going to be equal to negative E times delta V. And then we look at this potential difference. We are going from high potential to low potential when we're moving in the direction of the electric field. High to low, final minus initial is low minus high, which is then a negative value. So delta V here is negative. Negative times negative gives us positive, so we can just write it like this, where this is 
the charge of a proton or the absolute value of the charge of an electron, and this is the, the red stopping potential, not red, R-E-D, the R-E-A-D, stopping potential, whatever you read this to be, it stops any current from being measured. So we can go back with this and think about different work functions, what amount of kinetic energy is left over, and then start measuring stopping potentials for that given wavelength and that given work function of the material. And they all have different stopping potentials. Depend. Depend. All right, so we'll come back, do a little problem involving this, and it's going to be that. But it, was another um, nice experiment, really one of the fundamental experiments, which really showed and proved the behavior of light um, in terms of its particle nature, and really substantiated the idea of the photon, and you couldn't deny it after this. One-to-one -one interaction, that wouldn't happen with waves. So the light was behaving more like a particle in this particular experiment. And there you go, photons, quanta of light. Good day. Until next.